Hello, I'm Nirant. You might know me from the NLP book I've written for developers or my other work in natural language processing where I also maintain the awesome NLP repository on GitHub. I've been working on NLP for the last two to three years and across machine learning for five years. Today, I do data engineering and tech at Sundial. Today, I'm going to talk about natural language processing without tons of data, tons of math, and preferably even without hiring a data scientist for what you might want to do. This is a talk which is accessible for developers with general Python or programming language background who want to bring natural language processing to the toolkit of which they have, to the skill set which they have. By end of this talk, even if you're not very, very good with NLP today, you will know of a tool which you can use to build NLP components ranging from things like classification to translation with just an API call and a few examples custom to your use cases and preferably trained to your domain. Why is the specific technology which you're talking about GPT-3 or the general purpose transformers worth your time? The most important thing is perhaps the fact that you do not need to write extra machine learning code for it. The fancy way to call this would be a codeless NLP. You can build your NLP system without a data scientist writing code to train and uh, then serve your models. Similarly, you will not require an engineering team which can then serve your machine learning model to production. The other real advantage of not doing these two things is that you can quick, you're really quick to launch. As an example, businesses like copy.ai and PepperType have gotten to multi hundred thousands of dollars or millions of dollars building on top of GPT-3. So it's really not just good for very, very early stage prototyping, but also to your first dollar and to hundreds of thousands of dollars. GPT-3 has more than one use cases. Some commercial examples are generating ideas for blogs, one-line tweets, and in some cases, even bullet points, which can then be expanded into blogs. So the main idea being that you can generate text as you want, and then you apply it across the stack. The only real limitation to keep in mind is that you will not do really long form text generation. So as an example, a short story of a Nathaniel Hawthorne lens or a, an, even an Enid Blyton lens is something which GPT-3 is not great at today. Just to quickly summarize a few more examples, class, all sorts of basic tasks like sentiment classification is something which GPT-3 does out of the box really well. When we say really well, it means it can work with multiple classes, it can work with very, very few examples where very, very few is as little as two or three examples. And on the extreme, if your sentences are really simple, like movie reviews or uh, app reviews, you can probably do it without any examples. The without any example scenario is what we might typically call zero shot learning in the machine learning context. Other cool use cases of GPT-3 is taking a text either as instruction or as a sample and transforming it into something. So as an example, you can think of every language translation going from English to French as translation. Another way which you can think about translation is taking natural language instructions, so let's say English, to a programming language or an instruction language or a query language. So you could use a GPT-3 model to give instructions or write a doc string and generate Python code snippets from it or generate SQL queries from it. GPT-3 on the extreme can also help you do question answering. The model is imperfect and has some errors, but it can read a paragraph or a passage and answer questions based on that. It can also answer a few questions based on general knowledge. As an example, typical geography questions which do not change over time are, are something which OpenAI will typically, be, uh, OpenAI's GPT-3 will be good at. Keep in mind, that the training samples for this are mostly American, mostly English. So your answers might be biased towards that. So as an example, if you were to ask what is the most popular breakfast, you should expect the answer to be bacon and eggs and not chai and poha. A few more limitations to keep in mind now that we are on the topic is that GPT-3 does not really do any sort of image, speech or audio. That does not mean that you cannot work with these. As an example, you can take speech and convert it into text and then work with it. Since the training sample for this is mostly English and based on the American internet, as an example, Wikipedia and the larger internet being American heavy, it struggles really hard beyond English. 
it can handle a bunch of english dialects ranging ranging from the indian ones to the british ones and the and the spelling uh, correspondingly but be anything beyond english it will really struggle and anything beyond european languages let's say french or german which are not that popular on internet for instance hindi or marathi or kannada it will be much worse off the major limitation when you're designing a system using gpt3 is that the output is unstable what does that mean what that means is for identical inputs and identical configuration your output can change on every api call open ai gpt3 has gotten stable over time in the sense that it tries to be more and more predictable but that does not mean that it is completely deterministic it continues to be a probabilistic system and the output will continue to be unstable with the identical inputs it will have different responses i have been mentioning open ai gpt3 quite some time so far i think it's worth mentioning a minute or two on what open ai is and it's very very brief history open ai started in 2015 as a not for profit with very illustrious backers from alon musk to sam altman of y combinator uh, back in 2019 it accepted a 1 billion dollar investment from microsoft and converted itself to a for profit institution today open ai has a bunch of licensed apis most uh, popular and useful is what we are discussing today the gpt3 and a corresponding open source free to use counterpart for gpt3 should you choose to deploy your own model is called gpt j6 billion by a team called oiloider ai which is a not for profit group of volunteers who are not just volunteer on code but also on data and other benchmarking related problems a very popular use case among developers uh, from of a fork of a gpt3 is called github copilot which is an auto complete prompt the reason microsoft could use that is because microsoft has an exclusive license to move open ai technology in particular gpt3 that means microsoft could have gone to gpt3 and requested a fork of the uh, gpt3 models and said okay now that we know what the code and data looks like i want to use this for, on a different data set which is let's say github's code before we continue i want to spend the rest of this talk teaching how to and demoing how to of how you can use this in your day to day life begin with i will talk about the query structure a query structure is a very very fancy way of saying that how do you give an input to the gpt3 i have a very plain text prompt on my screen which is a very very simple classification problem but requires context from the outside world as an example this is a list of companies and the categories they fall into that is the instruction part of my input then i give it a format i say facebook and i say it is social media comma technology and then i give it a few more examples and i have selected these examples as a human the order of the examples is something which gpt3 will also use as a guideline the example which is most closest to the query when i say closest i mean location so as an example in this particular screenshot on the screen you will see that fedex is closest to mcdonalds then unilever and then uber and so on the query will always be biased towards the most recent example so you should be careful of not just about the examples you are selecting but also in the order in which they have been given as an input the number of examples here is 5 but that is not necessary i am reasonably optimistic that this would work perfectly well with even one or two examples because the ultimate thing which gpt3 learns is the context which it is required to tap into i'm going to spend the remainder of this session into giving at least four to five demos on how we can use to begin with since we are talking to de developers i'm going to talk about how we can use this to generate code snippets in particular from natural language to python this is what a gpt3 playground looks like the playground has a bunch of prebuilt samples which are always there in the examples and a parts uh, part of the screen called engine where you can select what these engines are we will talk about the engines in a little more detail the next setting is what we call temperature a mental model to think about temperature is basically randomness as the temperature approaches zero as the prompt also says it will become repetitive and deterministic 
when I said the output is unstable, that is typically because we do not operate at zero temperature. You want the model to have some degree of control and creativity. It's a little bit of a misnomer for, for me to call it control and mis, uh, creativity because at the end of the day, it is sampling from a range of inputs. The next thing which we should pay attention to or a limitation of this API is the maximum length of the output which you can generate from this. The output length is measured in tokens and not words. A to word could be made up of multiple tokens. So for example, let's say you talk about the word aluminum. GPT-3 could bro break that word into multiple tokens, which we do not always know upfront of. It could be broken up into alum and then menium, or it could be broken into al, uh, alu, mini and em. We do not know what that token breaking looks like. A good heuristic to keep in mind is that a token is roughly four English characters. Keep in mind that spaces do not count as tokens, but punctuations and all, all punctuations except spaces are counted in your tokens. When you are being built, even spaces count as tokens. It's only, or when you send a request, they are counted as tokens. It's only in the maximum length where the token, so space token is sometimes ignored or considered as part of the token itself because it can also break aluminum space as one large string and break it into multiple tokens. The next interesting thing I want to talk about in the interface is called top P. Remember when I was talking about control and creativity, this is exactly the parameter set which we're going to discuss about next. Top P is basically a way of saying how much diversity do I want the model to have. Diversity, what does diversity mean here? As I mentioned, the model actually samples from a range. What does, how does it sample? How much randomness do you want to give it? How much variety do you want in your output? Is this what, is exactly what this parameter controls? This parameter controls how many of the options or of the range of inputs should it look at? Typically, I like to run at one, which means that I want the model to look at all possible inputs which are given by the base API before it generates and selects one uh, final output for me. Keep in mind, all the samples which were uh, used to and selected before it gave me one output are not accessible to me. I only have access to the one output which the API gives back to me. The next three parameters are uh, easier to understand, easier to build your mental models around with a few examples and probably will have the most influence on how you, how you model your problems. The next is what we call the frequency penalty. The frequency penalty is a very, very simple criteria to say that do not repeat what I have said as is. A frequency penalty of zero means I do not care if you, if you repeat the same thing. A frequency penalty of one or, or higher means that if you repeat what I've already said as part of input, please do not do that. You will go through a very, very large penalty. The presence penalty is the same ideology as frequency except that it considers not just what we have given as input, but also what the model itself has spoken so far or generated so far, more precisely. As you increase the presence penalty, the odds that the model will talk about new topics in a longer form generation, or it will get chaotic, will increase. To rephrase the same idea, as you increase the frequency and presence penalty, you will have more and more randomness in your model generation. The next parameter is what we call best of. The best of is a way on the opposite side of the top P parameter. In the sense, while top P looks at everything and selects one, the best of generates multiple sequences and then selects one of them. It is a very expensive operation. This is expensive because when you're selecting multiple sequences and generating multiple sequences and then selecting one of them, you still get billed for every sequence which you have generated. While the top P parameter works on one token at a time, it samples from a list of tokens and selects one. It is a parameter to control how many tokens do you look at. A best of is typically thought of in a sequence sense. There are few more uh, parameters which the API grants you and they're more focused towards text generation and giving you control of when to interrupt and when to continue your text generation. As an example, 
it has something called as an inject start text, a stop sequence, and an inject restart text. Let's talk about the stop sequence. That is something which I have used quite often in a chat context or demos around that. So here is a very in inbuilt basic demo from uh, OpenAI GPT-3 itself, where we say that we have an AI assistant and we have given it a personality which is helpful, creative, clever, and very friendly. And we have given it stop sequences of human and AI. What that means is let's say I generate, I have a sentence uh, which I want to generate from human. The moment it generates the next sentence which says AI, it will automatically stop generation. This is extremely useful to ensure that your outputs are well formed, something which you can parse and break on the, let's say on a new line token or a different token. And you can parse it and give it back to your end user if you have one, which is not yourself. Note the other configuration settings in this example as well. The temperature is quite high at 0.9. The maximum length is 150 tokens, which give or take should be about 10 to 12 words. The top P is one. The frequency penalty is zero because the input prompt is anyway quite small. The presence penalty is still okay at 0.6 or what we might say medium in my opinion. And what this means is that the, the generation will try not to repeat itself. We also have start and restart text. So combination of a stop and a restart text means that I could just keep clicking generate to continue a conversation. But each generation will be exactly one sentence pair. This is very, very useful if you're trying to automate a chat conversation where you have multiple messages from the end user and you want to generate exactly one response and then wait for the user to get back to you. And one, once the user has gotten back to you, you add it to your existing prompt and then fire a new request. Instead of just completely firing and expecting a complete chat conversation to happen in one go. It gives you a greater degree of control, both in terms of the text as well as how many configuration and settings you want to play with. So let's try this once and see what happens. I'm going to, uh, the conversation goes, human goes, hey, hello, who are you? And AI says, or introduces itself and says, I'm an AI created by OpenAI and says, how can I help you today? I'm going to say as a human that I'm looking for the best chai in United Kingdom. And let's see what the AI responds with. And AI tells you, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm not sure what chai is. This is, as a reminder, a classic example of what uh, American internet heavy AI trained on might look like. Let me change this to say, I'm looking for the best burger. The best burger is at Five Guys. It has a response for you. I have no idea what Five Guys is, but AI has a response for you. Let's look at some more examples. Let's look at our original favorite example, which is natural language to Python. I'm going to give it some string, a doc string prompt, not quite different from how we would write a doc string for a function. And we say, okay, step one is create a list of first names. Step two is create a list of last names and then combine them randomly into a list of hundred full names. And let's see what it does. While it is generating the text, let me introduce what these parameters for this are. The temperature here is zero because the code should be as deterministic as possible. You will also notice that the engine here has changed to something what you might, uh, you might see is not text hyphen Da Vinci anymore, but code hyphen Da Vinci. What this means is this is a model which has looked at code for quite a few times and has probably not looked at English examples. What code has it looked at? It has looked at code across Stack Overflow and GitHub primarily from what we have been, what we are aware of. Notice that there are no stop sequences because for code generation, we do not know what that might look like. We do not have a restart sequence because we are not interrupting abruptly. There is no frequency penalty because we do not give input code. There is no presence penalty because while generating the code, you might want to repeat a snippet. Note that the model cannot reuse the functions which it itself has written, but it can reuse Python primitives. Hence, in terms of variable naming, we do not want to penalize OpenAI to reuse variables it has declared. The best of is still at one. Let's look at what our output has. It has imported the correct module. It has generated a list of first names and a last name. The 
the list we do not specify a length of the list so we do not know how many names they are but they look quite a few and it also declares a list called full names then it declares correctly that it wants 100 names which is exactly what we had specified we wanted 100 full names and now let's see what is the append it what is it adding to the list interesting it is doing a random dot choice of first names and random dot choice of last names and adding a space in between to get give us a first name last name pair and then printing it Note that in our original doc string, we did not specify if we wanted to print it or return it. It chose, given that there is no function declaration here, to print it, assuming that it, I'm guessing that, biz, that it is a script and hence print uh, on std out. At the end of it, you will see that GPT-3 has generated some garbage. It has generated instructions which might be contained in continuation of this. This is a quite common problem with unstable outputs. There is no guarantee that if I call the same thing again, it will look differently. Let's do that again. I'm going to call this again and see what happens. I'm literally giving it the same input. I have not changed any of the settings. My maximum length is still 300 tokens. It is generating a list of first names, which is quite obviously different from the last time. The last names look different, but this time it has interrupted itself at line 18, which is printing the full names and has not generated any garbage uh, instructions for itself. Now let's do one more thing. Let's see if we can make this prompt slightly more interesting. We gave it an instruction to generate 100 full names, but what if the names is repeated? I do not want, if I'm generating a faker or a mock output, I do not want two Laura Fishers in my output. So I'm going to give it a name, of, uh, I'm going to change the prompt to say, combine them randomly into a list of 100 unique full names and see if it can uh, emphasize on that one word and generate code which takes that into consideration. Let's see what happens now. Okay, so we have our first names, we have our last names still being generated. The loop is fine and it completely missed it. It generated almost identical code logic as it was before that. Let's see if there's something else which we can do this to specify, to change that. Or would it, or because it has un unstable outputs, we should just try the same prompt again. We do not know. This brings me to the second pro uh, idea. Given that GPT-3 generations are unstable in time, it is very necessary and extremely useful that you have a method of evaluation for whatever that text or code might be. Let's think a little bit about how can we combine this into uh, how can we change the prompt to get 100 unique names? Let's see if the location of the word makes a difference. List of 100 full names. Generate. While it is generating, I would also like to call out that while we are using a UI for this demonstration, there is absolutely no reason to. It has a, OpenAI has a very stable, quite powerful OpenAI Python uh, API where you can specify the engine, which we just talked about, code da Vinci, prompt, which we are just writing, a temperature, all the other settings are available here. You can also use this with node, and, and also you can specify uh, all the configurations as a JSON setting, you can download them, and then plug it into your existing settings. So a workflow which you might have is you might have a UI where somebody who is an expert in the domain is building the configuration and playing with the API to get it right for the first time. Then it basically downloads the JSON and then you productize that. That is a completely valid workflow and I have built multiple systems for across domains ranging from uh, interview notes to uh, let's say clinical summaries. Although GPT-3 is not trained on clinical data, it does understand what an influenza or, or an arthritis or the common names are. So these are, these are, okay, this time around, this was even worse because it generated the first name James uh, multiple times. Okay, so we see that if I change the location of the word unique, it generates the prompt James multiple times. This is a very good uh, idea for me to introduce a presence penalty now. I am going to trade this off. As I mentioned, the primary mindset here is that GPT-3 should not be penalized for using a variable or a prompt which had, uh, or an import which it already has done. Let's see if that makes a difference. 
this seems to make a difference the word a first name james is not repeated anymore although the list of first names seems to be never ending maybe i should have put a cap on that let's see if that makes a difference create a list of 10 first names create a list of 10 last names and let's remove the criteria of 100 full names and see what happens we are still going to limit our maximum length to 300 tokens the intent behind showing you a few failed situations is that because you will go through all of these situations when you are writing your own code as well this time the code generation is almost identical to what we saw previously except that it ignores the criteria of unique full names completely what happens if i return uh, if i add a separate instruction to generate a uh, unique uh, unique names print unique full names note that the only difference in semantics here is that it is a separate instruction and absolutely nothing else and this time it gets it right this time it is it not only got it right when it said set of full names but it also added a one line comment saying that why it is doing that it first printed all the full names then it generated a separate comment saying unique full names and that is where it printed print of set of full names so prompts which we give to gpt3 influence that quite a lot another example which is something which i have seen in e-commerce quite often is to take a plain text a uh, description and break it down this is also what you might call an unstructured domain parsing note the gpt3 excels really well at doing passage comprehensions like these than it does to reading let's say e-commerce descriptions which are uh, just like bunch of strings uh, put together with commas and categorizing them uh, you could probably do a lot better with them using a different sorry a statistical parser so we see here in the sample that it's it's a fictional planet with fictional fruits which have flavors and colors which are familiar to us and it does a really really good job at breaking down the fruit uh, an imaginary fruit called neo skizzles and says okay it is in fact a purple and it tastes like candy the rest of these also for the most part look right i think it missed sour and bitter and acidic and caustic and has a pale orange tinge to them okay yeah so this is also correct it is sometimes picking part of the flavor profile as an example for the fruit glowl it only picked sour and bitter and not acidic and caustic which also probably does not make sense why would you have both acidic and caustic other few examples which are very very common is summarization task you can give up instruction like summarize this for a second grade student your entire passage and depending on the le maximum length which you allow gpt3 will generate a summary for this these are all off the shelf examples which they already come with let's try something different i want to talk about style transfer what is style transfer style transfer is giving one text like this and asking it to add another style element to it in this case we are asking it to make it more scary notice how complex this example is in the first instruction or the example which we are giving there is a plain sentence which has a first name uh, a person's name called nana we have another can person called doctor which does not have a name and there is another noun called a candy which is uh, and a medicine when we ask it to make and we ask it to make scary the instruction or the query which we ask it to do is a very very simple sentence an ugly dress but notice that we are asking the rewrite to include an metaphor even for a human to do this it would require at least an education equivalent of 6th or 7th graders or at least some practice with it let's see how it does we say that dress is a color of a wet dog that is quite harsh also a metaphor now let's see if we can change and let's make it a compliment instead instead of saying that is an ugly dress we're going to say that is an awesome dress and now we let's see if what it does with a metaphor it does not do that really well it says that is an awesome dress don't you think maybe the adjectives is already quite powerful and it is not able to build a metaphor on that let's see if we make change the adjective here to say a pretty dress it says the dress of yours is foolishly pretty i suspect a foolishly pretty is a form of a compliment and a metaphor at the same time 
let's try the same thing again. Given the GPT-3 has unstable output, we can get different prettier output again. This time around, it says that dress is a walking peacock. That definitely is a positive metaphor. Notice that not just it's not just the GPT-3 itself has unstable outputs, also that the, the in choice of the word which we gave as an adjective to the dress, pretty, ugly, or just the difference between awesome and pretty makes a difference on what output do we get. This is why it is almost always helpful to have a domain expert who is designing these prompts for your uh, use case and not just the developer. Given that you have to use very, very few prompts and you need only very, very few prompts to train the entire model, you can give access to this web interface itself to your domain expert or an API which such that you can save the JSON which I had mentioned earlier and then use that. That is a key consideration to keep in mind. Just to bring it back to uh, our notice again, there are four criteria to keep in mind. The first is what instruction do you use? The second is what examples are you using and in which, which format? The selection of which examples and the ordering. In the examples which I discussed across code and style transfer so far, I emphasize the selection and ordering of them. Now I want to spend some time discussing about the format. In the format so far, we, you will notice that in style transfer example, I use curly braces as an explicit marker of what I wanted. In the code example, we saw that you notice that I used the three double quotes or common doc string pattern in Python to separate out the instructions from the rest of the code. These style cues are quite popular and quite uh, quite popular for fo within folks who use the API and give you the most deterministic control and can be used for parsing the output out. For instance, in this metaphor generated sentence, now you know that your entire generation is between two curly braces, which is a very simple parser to write. Let's take a slightly more complex sentence. Instead of a debt is a pretty dress, let's say, uh, let's make a statement of fact. Let's say, India is a country in Asia which grows rice and wheat. And let's do a rewrite which praise, which has praise in it. Notice that this rewrite prompt is extremely ambiguous. The first statement is a statement of fact. India is a country in Asia which grows rice and wheat. And what I'm asking it to do is a statement of opinion. Uh, the rewrite is a statement of opinion. When I say I want a rewrite of the text which has praise in it. Let's see how it does. It generates, it first repeats itself. It says India is a country in Asia which grows rice and wheat. It is also a country, it continues, where the people are extremely friendly and food is some of the best in the world. Notice that in a rewrite, GPT-3 is not always confined to the exact rewrite which you, the exact input which, you, input which you pass to it. This is another limitation of GPT-3, that it can generate creative outputs. Is there a way to mitigate this? Probably. As an example, I will try this again with a little bit of frequency penalty so that it does not repeat itself. What I will also do is since I know that my input sentence is of about let's say 30 tokens, I'm going to reduce the generation uh, which I allow GPT-3 to do from 64 tokens to let's say 40 tokens and see if that makes a difference. Great, this time it generated a sentence which is, says India is a country in Asia which grows rice and meat and is also known for its great textiles. The short, short length and a frequency penalty definitely made a difference. Let me improve, change the frequency penalty to a higher value and see how that works. Notice all this while I'm working with exactly one example which has nothing to do with India or any of these facts. If you were to give it examples, this is complete garbage. This is a possibility when your frequency penalty is quite high uh, combined with a high temperature. The, com the com garbage, sorry. The response is a question asked to us which is completely garbage from any use case point of view. I want to highlight that all, all along this, I have not given it any statement or any example which is factual to an opinion conversion. I have given it a, a situation and I gave it a situation example. Let's try the same mapping again in the style transfer example. 
when instead of when the doctor asks nena to take medicine let's talk about a teacher student context the teacher asked the student for homework and i'm going to ask for i'm going to change the prompt to say or the instruction to say here is a rewrite of the text which is more angry and this time it says the teacher asked the student for homework but the student just sat there staring at her this is angry let's try something which we have already included in an instruction which is scary this time it says the teacher asked the student for homework and the student grew pale a classic marker of what a fear expression would be when you would write friction or situation in such a scenario again i want to highlight the importance of how you write your prompt and what examples do you give let's now that we have a sentence of two, now let now that we have two samples one which i wrote and one which i have generated from gpt3 let's try something else now i'm going to continue using the output which i have from gpt3 to get more examples let's take a student let's take another example instead of a doctor or a teacher student this time let's take a college student the college student went back home for vac for summer vacations to maldives here is a rewrite of the text which is which is more dangerous i have no idea what this will be because this, this instruction itself is ambiguous and quite noisy and it says the generation says the college student went back home for summer vacations to maldives where he spent his time fighting off a shark attack this is quite hilarious but it does have an element of danger you notice that the added prompt is almost completely from the pro one word prompt which we gave towards the end it is important in this particular sentence instruction that it is as close as possible to our final output we can also give it a hilarious or a dangerous uh, prompt we can choose the tone and we can make this also the input hilarious or dangerous or scary or use a metaphor as a configuration which your users can use this is exactly how platforms like paper type and copy.ai use for commercial use cases which we discussed earlier from everything from seo optimized descriptions for products to social media captions to tweet generations to ad copies to once again highlight why we this why this is so important and so powerful you do not need lot that much training data you need one domain expert to design your entire instruction which has which a uh, which is composed of the examples the specific order which again you can uh, make multiple versions of and that's literally it you might require as few as 5 or 10 examples all the examples which i shared today had one example in the code generation example i had zero examples there were no past snippets which i gave in that particular input how much training compute do we need do you need gpus for it or tons of cloud credits nope none uh if the, do you need a data scientist to do any of these no you probably do need somebody who can verify that this does work and can test it across multiple scenarios which your users might use it for and hence a verification or a validation criteria becomes very very important and how many developers do you need exactly one that's all there is already a python api which you can use if you're using it as a part of library and a node js counterpart in case you want to serve it through a js backend with that i'll i'll leave you and i hope that i've inspired you enough to apply for the gpt3 api beta access and try it and play with it uh, yourself see you around bye